Hi guys, welcome back to Drumhead. Uh, this lesson is going to be a little bit different because I'm going to ask a question first, which is, what is the jazz ride pattern and the technique that we need to use it? It's something that I'm asked a lot of the time. So, who better to ask than the man himself, Pete Cater? Thank Pete. you. Thank you, Rich. What is the technique we need to play this jazz ride pattern? Well, there are a number of schools of thought where that is concerned. And um, I have spent a lot of time for a lot of reasons, and mostly work-related and, and because I wanted certain outcomes from my own playing, analyzing this. And uh, a lot of players think of this jazz ride pattern as being like four quarter notes and then adding in the skip note. Now, I don't actually do that. I, I use a slightly different method. Um, and it's a method that was born of um, a desire to be able to play fast tempos uh, without tensing up, without getting tired, and without faking. Um, and what I actually do is rather than playing all four, so there you can see four complete strokes yeah. from down to up and down to up, uh, all the way through. What I actually do is I only play two motions in the bar. Um, here is where I think the True value lies in what a lot of people refer to as the molar system, where we're using upstrokes and downstrokes. And that's often wrongly thought of as just being a means of affecting dynamic changes, playing accents. So, you know, yeah. down, tap, up, all of that. Um, I use these kind of strokes to maximize my efficiency. Uh, and it's not necessarily to do with any kind of dynamic variation. And how that presents itself in the context of playing the jazz ride cymbal pattern is that I play an upstroke on one and three and a downstroke on two and four. So the upstroke is like that, and the downstroke is like that. So instead of going up and down four times in a bar of four, four time, I'm only doing it twice, so it's half the effort. And um, what people struggle with is getting the uniformity of dynamics between those four quarter notes. And because uh, in an earlier uh, session we were discussing grip, and I was yeah. talking about how I keep my whole hand wrapped around the stick, that really makes it easy to get that upstroke at the same weight dynamically, so to speak, as the downstroke. So, contrary to what is very often commonly done, i.e. closing the grip at the bottom of the motion, I close the grip at the top of the motion, like that. That's obviously an exaggerated yeah. movement. But as I'm making that upstroke, the fingers are just closing very gently yeah. around the stick as it comes up. Uh, a really good way of remembering how to do this is to think about playing the jazz ride pattern on the hi-hat. And the way to remember how it works is that as the pitch of the cymbals rises, that's where the stick rises. Yeah, yeah. So, let's put it on the cymbal. One, two, one, two. So it's really, really easy yeah. to do. And if you, pick, if you pick the tempo up a little bit. Again, up, down, up, down, yeah. up, down. Um, and when, you, when guys first try to do this, it usually ends up sounding like this. Yeah, the accent on it. Yeah, yeah. so, so there's, too much, there's too much, well, there's not sufficient emphasis on the one and three, and the two and four is, is overstressed. So, again, to reiterate, the way my technique works allows me to play. A 
allows me to play those four quarter notes um, with uh, <clears throat> equal dynamic weight. And the very slight closing of the fingers as I make the upstroke yeah. is where the skip note comes from. That's okay. just generated by a little squeeze of the, uh, of the stick into the hand. So if I do like almost like an exploded view of the pattern, what's going on is this. And I'm not doing, uh, well, like, like a lot of the guys yeah. you hear doing this. And that's really squeezed and squashed. Yeah, that, ju that just doesn't make it to yeah. me. That, that to me sounds like, sounds like ho half of a bad press roll. Um, <laughs> uh, maybe, yeah, maybe, yeah. maybe this is... Mm. It's like a jazz blast yeah, yeah. beat or, 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 or something from Whip, Whiplash where he starts bleeding all over the yeah, place. Yeah. You know. so, so your skip note there, if I'm right, is on the up? It's at the beginning of the, the upstroke. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. It is as I'm launching the stick back up, the closing, the ver uh, even, uh, it just has to be stressed while we're here that when I'm relaxing on the downstroke on the two and four, the fingers are still around the stick. I'm not going yeah, yeah. and throwing them, throwing them away yeah. because if they're out here, they're no use. Yeah. So they, they just need to stay in the zone where I require them to do their work. Now, I get a lot of um, experienced drummers coming to me uh, seeking help with their jazz playing um, because they want to kind of sound better at it. Hmm. And uh, again, this is one of those demonstrations that makes me shudder ever so slightly when it comes time to do it. Um, but with a lot of the guys who come through, who've come up f with more of a groove background, yeah. uh, I hear a lot of this. Yeah. And it's as much psychological as it is technical, because yeah. whether you realize it or not, if you've come up with, a, like, as I say, a groove, a backbeat, two and yeah. four kind of perspective, whether you realize it or not, you're centering your time on bass drum and the left hand. Uh, and of course, when it comes to playing jazz, that whole thing gets flipped on its head, and the time is centered on the ride and the, the left high. foot. And giving the bass drum and the snare drum a completely different role to play. And the biggest hurdle for guys when they come to this uh, for the first time is kind of having the, the, the trust in themselves and the confidence to move that time center away from here and put it on these two sounds. Which then brings us to what we do with uh, the other parts. Um, and what I do is... The first thing that I get people to do is just play every swung eighth note like this. All the way through the bar. This is a very, very common teaching strategy. Lots of people are into this. I mean, you probably do it yourself. Yeah, but it always causes issues with the left foot because then the left foot starts going with the left hand. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, well, I mean, that, that's what the, that kind of codependent thing is yeah. one of the things that, um, that w is a big part of, um, of, of learning independence, um, which also makes me think of another point um, of avoiding, and even with more advanced players, getting them to get away from this kind of magnetic pull of the downbeat yeah. Uh, and the quarter note pulse and, and being, uh, being able to <clears throat> kind of move freely through time without kind of needing that downbeat reference there. So we'll do all the eighth notes with the left hand, then all with the bass drum. And so on yeah, and so yeah. forth through yeah. the rest of the bar. Uh, now, what we're into here, this harks back to something we were talking about previously. This is facility-based learning. Yeah. Okay, We haven't got it to that idiomatic level yet. Uh, so the next thing we're going to do is groups of two. So every um, 
consecutive two swung eighth notes. And then with the bass drum. And all the way through the bar yeah. and likewise with groups of three. Now, here is the point where it actually becomes idiomatic. What we then have to do is to start to improvise the assignment of those notes between either the left hand or the bass drum. So let's take some groups of two and groups of three uh, and I'm going to show you uh, and the viewers at home how we just simply improvise and think about this has been a melodic relationship. Yeah. I mean, we don't have the 12 tones of the chromatic scale at our disposal, but there's no reason why No reason yeah. why we can't imply melody between these yeah. two sounds. So let's put that all together now. And that was one chorus of a well-known standard, but I'm not going to say what it was. I was just going to ask you that. Have you got a song in your head while always, you're playing that? Always, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. melodic fragments. That's yeah, where, yeah. Because I'm looking for melody yeah. between these two songs, melodic fragments are the inspiration. Yeah, and that was that was one chorus of an old stand, an old show tune, uh, which I won't mention, because if I do, then you'll have to pay copyright <laughs> okay. uh, when, the, when the video comes out. Uh, and and we, don't, we don't want all that to happen. <laughs> so that's the way I think yeah. about the comping element. Uh, and... So that raises another point, and that's the whole thing of internal dynamics, uh, because we want the ride cymbal to be the lead voice. That's yeah. what the musicians are listening to. And then this is in, the hi-hat foot is in second place. And for the most part, the comping should be supporting the ride pattern rather than cutting across it. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, if you're going for like a, an Elvin Jones with uh, John Coltrane type of vibe, then everything is, is, is the, you know, the energy level and the dynamic changes completely. But for, you know, our kind of starting point, functioning in a rhythm section, sounding good with a, an upright bass and a piano player, that's the way I balance the four limbs. And, you know, the analogy that I like to use um, that I've been... Uh, I, I came up with nearly 10 years ago now, and a, a, a lot of people have borrowed it, is to think of your four limbs as being like four faders on a mixing desk and being able to mix the drums so they sound good. Because you could be playing all the right stuff, but yeah. if the snare drum's too loud or the ride's too quiet, or the bass drum's too loud, whatever, it's not going to sound right. And that applies, it's a big key to authenticity in any style of music. Yeah. If you're playing rock and, yeah. and the snare drum backbeat, isn't there or the bass drum's not prominent enough, that's not going to sound right either. So internal balance is a big, big uh, stepping stone towards authenticity of style. Do you know, I, I had no idea where that came from. I just knew it came from somewhere, mm. the, the whole idea. Well, I'd never heard it before I, 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 uh, I came up with yeah, it. Yeah, well, it's something I use. I just didn't necessarily, it's a great exercise. Yeah. I would call, I, I, I'd call it the, the human mixer. Yes, absolutely. So uh, yeah. particularly with, with beginners mm. where... You find that a beginner in a in a basic eighth note rock groove, the the hi hat's the loudest thing you know in the world always, ever. Yeah, yeah, always. And and you kind of try and work on that and just yeah. sort of get the balance in your yeah. playing. But that's mm -hmm. you know that's brilliant. and you know because particularly you know, somebody who's grown up without previously having done anything like this, they're used to the dominant hand yeah. being the thing that you know does all the work. It writes knife and fork, opening doors, yeah, yeah. whatever. So it's naturally the most developed, and uh, mm. and, and so. Getting the everything else to come up yeah. and make a nice musical, cohesive sound on the instrument is uh, 
is is in some way, you know, it's more important than technique. Yeah. Because it's a it's a big step towards sounding musical, and that's that's really what what that's really what we're after. Yeah, absolutely. Is the on when you're playing the ride? Are you always always playing the skip note, or are you sometimes just playing the quarter note? I, 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 I change it around. I change yeah. it around. And if you know, listen to like um, when Steve Gadd played "Love for Sale," yeah, Buddy Richard, there's a lot of just quarter notes in that. Really, yeah, sort so, of driving uh, it forward. Uh, uh, Steve likes to play uh, not too much skip notes. Yeah. Um, he's one of the few drummers uh, who I've listened to a great deal that does that. Um, and uh, another guy who, who I heard do that quite a lot was Grady Tate. Uh, he didn't put skip note as much as maybe a lot of other players mm. necessarily would. And it's quite interesting. There's a, a great American singer I work with regularly um, uh, called Selena Jones. And Selena just likes four in the ride cymbal. She right. doesn't like skip notes. Mm. Uh, I sneak a few in, though, when she's, <laughs> when she's uh, in, in catch her out. But two of the drummers that she's worked with and really enjoyed in, in uh, years gone by are Steve Gadd and Grady Tate, right. both of whom are, are very much four in a bar ride cymbal players. Yeah, so yeah. I don't know if it just kind of kind of res registered in her subconscious as a result of <coughs> working with those two great guys. Yeah, yeah. But, but again, I suppose we got, it goes back to what we've said, what we've said on the channel so many times and what you've said, before. it's got to be a choice. Yeah, yeah, it, absolutely. It, it's a choice as to what you play, when you play it, how you play it, all these things, you have to make that choice first. Yeah, definitely. To, definitely. To, to make the music better, which mm -hmm. is the end result of everything that we do of in, course. In, in general life, isn't yeah. it? To make the music better. To absolutely. Better. And that, that's... That, that, you know, if, if people watching this take nothing else away from it other than that, yeah. then, then our work is kind of done. Yeah. You know, we, we, we want drummers who are good musicians and musicians who are good drummers. That's, that's, that's what it's all about. All the, uh, all the you know, Instagram shredding yeah, yeah. is for nothing if, if you can't sit down and, with some people and, and, and make some music. Yeah, no, I, I mean, that's something, again, you probably agree with, this. something that I use with my guys all the time, is that you're a musician first who plays the drums. Exactly. You know, like yeah, a, exactly. A, a professional footballer is a professional footballer who plays in this position. Yeah, not, rather, not rather just than a goalkeeper. Some, rather, or yeah. rather, rather than somebody who's on a beach in Rio somewhere doing tricks and, yeah. and keeping yeah. the ball in the air for 20 minutes. Yeah. That's what a lot of the kind of Instagram drum stuff reminds me of. Yeah. Uh, I think that's a, that's not an unfair analogy. Mm. There's plenty of good drumming on Instagram, yeah. but there's there's a lot of stuff that um, is perhaps not the most constructive influence uh, for some of the younger players who are coming through. Yeah, and and a, sometimes a little bit of guidance, a little bit of wise counsel uh, to steer the uh, musicians of uh, of the future in the right direction, I think is really important. Because you have to think where we're up to now. Here it is. It's it, you know, it's 2019, it's going to be 2020 yeah. in a few weeks' time. And there is now, we're in this unique position where there's over a century of recorded music yeah. to be influenced mm -hmm. by. Mm -hmm. And don't, so as a result, don't just draw your influence. This is for all the young players out there, particularly, but for everybody, don't just draw your influence from what you've seen on Instagram in the last week. Get, get cunning, get creative. Listen to some <clears throat> British music, listen to some North American music, listen to some Brazilian music, some Afro-Cuban music, European music, African music, music from the Far East. Yeah. There's a century and a whole world of music out there. And the people who are going to have the most impact in the future are the people who are getting smart now about really having a very strong historical perspective yeah. on what the instrument can do. Fantastic advice, Pete. As always. Thank you very much. My pleasure. There you go, guys. Another fantastic lesson. Take your time with it. Explore the possibilities. And above all else, as we always say, just have fun with it. And we'll see you next time.